Welcome, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program uh, on the legacy of Mikhail Sergeyev Gorbachev. Um, I'm Susan Elliott, President and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. Um, this morning, our program will focus on the complex legacy of the last leader of the Soviet Union, as I mentioned, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. You know, under his leadership, which was from 1985 to 1991, there was a notable thawing of relations between the Soviet Union and the West, which eventually led to the end of the Cold War. Mr. Gorbachev's great economic reform projects called Glasnost, which is openness or perestroika change, promised more transparency, modification of the state controlled economy, as well as restructuring of Soviet systems by allowing multi-candidate elections. Like many traditional uh, transitional leaders, he was caught between criticisms from communist hardliners who considered his reforms too liberal and liberals who argued that his change was not happening fast enough. So today we want to explore the life and legacy of Mr. Gorbachev and look at it from the perspectives, not um, only of the West, but you know, how do we remember him? Um, how do we think Russians remember him? And what are maybe some of the unique lessons we can learn from um, his legacy. So we are honored today to have an outstanding group of experts uh, gathered to help us to analyze the political life and legacy of Mikhail Sergeyevich. Um, I'm gonna briefly introduce our esteemed panelists and tell you that if I, took, uh, if I told you all their accomplishments, that would take the full hour. So I'm just gonna give the highlights um, so that everyone knows um, uh, the panelists. But I'll first start with Ambassador Paula uh, Dobriansky. Ambassador Dobriansky is a foreign policy expert and former diplomat specializing in national security affairs. Currently, she's a senior fellow in the Future of Demo uh, Diplomacy Project at Harvard Kennedy's Belfer Center, <clears throat> excuse me, for Science and International Affairs, and as well is the vice chair of the Schoolcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. I best know Ambassador Dobriansky for when she served as Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs at the US Department of State. And it, she has gotten high honors for her work as the President's Envoy to Northern Ireland. She received the Secretary of State's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Medal, Medal for her contributions in the historic devolution of power in Belfast. But she served for more than 25 years in many other national security affairs, and she held many Senate confirmed positions, including um, being the affairs at the National Security uh, Council. We also have Ambassador Jack Matlock, who was U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1991. So he had a front row seat in, in working and dealing with um, um, Gorbachev. He also is a, a diplomat who served at, as U.S. Ambassador, not only U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, but he was also U.S. Ambassador to the Czech um, Republic. During 35 years in the Foreign Service, he served also in Washington uh, on the National Security Council and was Senior Director for European and Soviet Affairs um, there from 1983 to 1986. Following his diplomatic career, he was Kenan Professor at the Institute for Advanced Studies and has written numerous articles and books about the negotiations that ended the Cold War and um, the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Um, and before he joined the Foreign Service, he um, was an instructor in Russian language and literature at Dartmouth College. And finally, we have Dr. Raymond Smith. Um, Dr. Smith served for more than 40 years um, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, not only as a diplomat, but a businessman, consultant, teacher, and author. Um, he also served six years at U.S. Embassy in Moscow, including three years as Minister Counselor of Political Affairs. So he also had a front row seat in what happened at the end of the Soviet Union. Um, Ray has also had a distinguished academic career, has written many influential publications, including Negotiating with the Soviets and the Craft of Political Analysis for Diplomats. And finally, we have uh, Thomas Graham, who is well known to all of the NCAFP um, members and patrons. Um, he currently serves as Distinguished Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. But he also had an exceptional uh, diplomatic career, serving at U.S. Embassy 
Moscow in the late Soviet period and the mid 1990s. He was special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia at the National Security Council staff. And <clears throat> he also managed the White House Kremlin strategic dialogue. Again, since his diplomatic career, uh, Tom has been a renowned public intellectual and received numerous teaching appointments throughout his career. So before we start, let me just give some of the ground rules. Um, should you have a question for today's discussion for our plan list, we ask that you use the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will do our best to answer as many questions as time allows. We'll have a guided discussion with Tom and the panelists, and then we'll move to the Q&A. Um, and as a reminder, we're recording today's program. So it will be available for viewing. If you know someone who wasn't able to join us this morning, um, they can find it on the NCAFP's YouTube channel. Um, and the, because we are recording and it will be on our YouTube channel, everything is on the record. So I will now turn the panel over to Tom. And again, thanks to all of you for participating and thanks to our panelists for what I know is gonna be a fantastic discussion. So over to you, Tom. Uh, thank you very much, Susan, and it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today and, uh, of course, with this distinguished panel. We're here to talk about Gorbachev, uh, a major statesman of the late 20th century. And like all major statesmen, he was a man of contradictions. He's a man who made history, uh, perhaps not the history he intended to make. He entered uh, office hoping to revitalize the Soviet Union uh, so that it would enter the 21st century as a major global power, and he ended up unleashing the forces that led to the demise of his country. He entered office a convinced communist, hoping to revitalize Marxism-Leninism, and eventually found that Marxism-Leninism didn't have the answers to the challenges that his country was facing. And at the same time, uh, he was a statesman who played an instrumental role along with Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush and bringing an end to the Cold War uh, and creating an environment uh, that offered uh, the possibility of much more constructive relations between the United States and Russia. He was revered in the West for his role in ending the Cold War and reviled in the Soviet Union and in Russia ever since for the role he played uh, in the demise of that country. You know, today, as we scrape the, the depths of antagonism uh, in U.S.-Russian relations, I think it's worth remembering that there was a period of much greater hope for the future of relations between our two countries, and it's worth considering what lessons we can draw from that period that might help us uh, see our way through what is an extremely complex and dangerous period in global affairs. Uh, so I'd like to start the conversation uh, by turning to Ambassador Matlock, uh, someone who had perhaps the most contact with Gorbachev of any of us, uh, in this discussion today, uh, and pose the first question, uh, which is, was Gorbachev, in your, to your mind, really a radically different type of Soviet leader? And if he was, at what point did you realize that after he ascended to power in 1985, and perhaps more important, when did Pro President Ronald Reagan realize that he had a different type of Soviet leader to deal with, and a much more promising uh, future for U.S.-Soviet relations? Well, that realization came I'd say gradually, because initially, when Gorbachev was named uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, we, we uh, understood that he was a different person of a younger generation, uh, and uh, that his habits were quite different. Uh, the official CS, uh, CIA assessment was that uh, he, uh, his goals had not changed, but he might be a more effective Soviet leader. Uh, therefore, he was potentially more dangerous. I think that, uh, um, uh, I know <laughs> that, uh, uh, I know because he wrote it in his diary and his memoirs, uh, that uh, President Reagan uh, wanted to test him. Was, you know, was he going to be different or not? And that was one of the questions that uh, uh, he was asking. Uh, so that I think that our early policy, uh, when we set forward a four-part agenda, it was to 
push the envelope, you might say, and to see to what degree he was willing uh, if uh, 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 to uh, make uh, some basic changes in Soviet policy. Our main aim was to, um, uh, was to prevent the aggressive uh, stance of the Soviet Union and its attempt to impose its system on others. Uh, Reagan did not see himself as someone who was going to bring down communism in the Soviet Union, but he concentrated on how to deal with the individual. And I would say before he first met Gorbachev in 1985, he wrote out in, uh, in his long hand on a pad, his thoughts about Gorbachev. These were handed to me his, in typed form, his secretary typed it up uh, before we left for Geneva in that first meeting. This is very interesting because he was concentrating on how you make a, you might say a human contact uh, with the Soviet leader. And there were several points there. He talked about human rights very extensively but said, we're too upfront. If we push him publicly, we will actually hurt the people. We have got to do that privately. That's one thing that later very much changed in our policy. Second, uh, he, uh, he, his highest aim was to develop some more confidence in the relationship. And the next to the last sentence in that memo was whatever we achieve, we must not call it victory because that will simply make other achievements more difficult. These were, I think, great insights. And uh, uh, though I think our attitude was, uh, we will, we will uh, uh, push to see how much he changes. And you know, by 1987, uh, that agenda that we set was accepted implicitly as a joint agenda because we never, we said these are our aims, but we never called it our agenda. Uh, and now, uh, when did uh, Reagan realize that he had a real partner? To judge from his, uh, his diaries and his notes, uh, I think it was when he left their last meeting in December, uh, uh, of uh, uh, 1988, they had met on Governor's Island in New York when Gorbachev came to address the United Nations, uh, at which point uh, he announced in, in effect the liberation of Eastern Europe. Uh, that was the effect and dropped Marxism-Leninism as a basis of his foreign policy. That was a very basic thing. And Reagan noted in his diary, we parted as partners to make a better world. And I think by that time, they began to realize that at least basically as different as these two people were and as different as the systems were, one of the things that united them was they both hated nuclear weapons. They both genuinely thought we could get rid of them uh, if we tried. And I think both of them tried, uh, though uh, they failed in that. They did succeed in, uh, in concluding uh, some of the most important uh, early arms control agreements that uh, without which we would not have ended the Cold War. Finally, I would say that uh, there are the other aspects, and I'm sure these will come up, uh, that uh, this was all joined at the same time with very fundamental changes in uh, the way the Soviet Union was ruled uh, by the Communist Party and by uh, uh, Gorbachev's increasing efforts to introduce more democratic procedures. That's a separate issue, but that process uh, going simultaneously with settling the other problems that had confronted us uh, very much facilitated uh, the end of the Cold War. And by the way, I think it was over ideologically by the end of 1988, uh, when uh, President Reagan, uh, just before he left office in January 89. 
Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Matlock. Uh, Paula, uh, you know, Ambassador Matlock has mentioned the skepticism that uh, Gorbachev was greeted with in Washington. I'd like to drill down on that a little bit, if I, if I could. You talked about new thinking in international affairs almost from the very beginning. I mean, you're sitting in Washington. Um, I think there was great skepticism about what was really new in this uh, in his foreign policy. So you give us a sense of what was uh, what were the continuing concerns within Washington about the conduct of Soviet foreign policy at this point uh, that led us to believe that Gorbachev was perhaps not a new uh, a new uh, revolutionary figure uh, in in the Soviet Union, but someone who would pursue uh, perhaps with much more vigor. Uh, a foreign policy that we thought was detrimental to American interests. Right. Well, absolutely. Well, first, I think that Ambassador Matlock really gave a, a very uh, a good and 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 thorough overview of what was the backdrop for the reaction in Washington. Uh, let me just mention a few points uh, to 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 at the same time maybe to amplify. When Gorbachev came in uh, in uh, 1985 as the uh, general secretary of the, the Communist Party, you know, he's looked at as someone, although of a different generation, he was someone who came up through the Soviet hierarchy and the Communist Party hierarchy. And he was also someone who certainly in, uh, uh, when one looks at his uh, initial, you know, time and tenure, that he was someone who seemed to pursue a kind of orthodoxy, that uh, it was uh, an orthodoxy and there wasn't some indication of change. Um, uh, the policies were pretty much uh, the same in terms of the kind of clampdown on, on uh, 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 human rights, on fundamental freedoms, uh, et cetera. Then I think there was a point where there was, I believe, the 27th uh, Communist Party uh, that it was, if you will, in the aftermath of that and the end of that year of uh, 86, late 86 into 87, where then one witnessed and observed uh, some shifts. Uh, of course, this came with the enunciation of perestroika and glasnost, uh, glasnost openness and perestroika restruct, meaning restructuring. Here, I think there was a wariness and the wariness was, well, okay, um, uh, uh, then uh, uh, the Soviet Union was certainly, and, and Russia in particular, was not doing well economically. Um, looking at the, the conditions within, they were rather dire. But there was skepticism about whether these policies and the articulation of these policies genuinely would really mean anything new. So this comes to, I'd say, a kind of a point where then uh, those in Washington were looking at, well, what are the practical actions that we're witnessing? And let me pick out three areas where one could discern and see that there was a kind of evolution. Ambassador Matlock mentioned the issue of human rights. Well, it was during that period where actually it was taken note that the level of visas that were being issued then to Soviet Jews uh, actually had been expanded and um, uh, increased. Uh, it was during that time also that Sakharov uh, was uh, released. Uh, it was during that time, ultimately, that uh, uh, Anatoly Sharansky, now Natan Sharansky, also uh, came through and came out of the Gulag. You also had uh, significantly uh, 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 a, an opening of the media, uh, that heretofore there was an absolute clampdown and there was a real shift taking place uh, in that space. And then even thirdly, there was an opening with regard to foreign companies, um, where foreign companies could come in and uh, you know, partnerships were being spawned. So I'm mentioning this because first I would say there was absolute skepticism, a feeling that it was going to be more of the same and that these were just words that were hurled out there, but in terms of concrete actions or real, real you know, uh, uh, policies that one could point to where there seemed to be a real change and a shift. I think the initial reaction was certainly one of skepticism and great doubt, 
But then at that period, in the aftermath of that party Congress, late 86 and into 87, it was, well, there are some things changing. And these are the kinds of things that actually we should look at more seriously and engage in. And let me end on this note, um, the area of human rights. You know, before that, and I know this from my time in the State Department and actually in the Human Rights Bureau, I remember when we tried to forge a dialogue and the answer was, no, this is not your business and there's no discussion or discourse. And, and that we saw as very much you know, shifting and where there was actually a direct dialogue, an actual handing over of a list that was accepted, not refused. So then I think it could be said um, in terms of the Washington reaction, it was really looking at, we need to look at this more closely and see where our interests align and those areas where we could possibly advance the agenda uh, with Moscow. So Paula, uh, in, in a sense, it was a domestic change inside the Soviet Union uh, that led us to believe that perhaps there's greater opportunity on a broader agenda in, in US-Soviet relations at that point. And that brings me uh, to the question I want to ask uh, you, Ray, uh, as we focus a little bit on the Soviet uh, domestic politics at that time. You know, you're famous, at least within the, the circle of Soviet and Russia experts, uh, for this cable you drafted in Moscow uh, it was titled Looking into the Abyss, Abyss written in uh, 1990, if I remember correctly, uh, which suggested that we ought to uh, give greater uh, thought to how we would deal with the uh, various scenarios in, in the Soviet Union, including the possible breakup. The question I have for you, Ray, is from your perch in Moscow, uh, what role did you think Gorbachev and his policy played uh, in bringing the country to the edge of the abyss? <laughs> Well, uh, the, uh, the genesis of the cable itself actually was a, uh, a, a, a conference that I went to sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I had the opportunity there to talk to uh, a number of Soviet citizens who themselves were talking about whether the Soviet Union could continue to exist. I remember talking to one prominent Soviet historian um, who was speculating about whether even Ukraine and Belarus could continue to be part of uh, the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, the, the nationalities issue was, uh, was obviously a key one. Uh, I remember on another occasion seeing an editorial cartoon in one of the uh, Moscow newspapers about um, satirizing the independence movements that were developing in the various uh, republics of the Soviet Union. And this particular cartoon showed a street corner in Moscow, in which every corner was declaring independence from the Soviet Union. So I think what was happening was that uh, the perception was growing in the Soviet Union that um, the regime was not willing to use force to impose its will upon Soviet society any longer. And that began to release uh, pent up feelings about uh, national independence. And uh, so in a sense, uh, it was that loss of willingness to impose one's will in the society, um, which was partly due to uh, a loss of belief in the ideology and partly due to Gorbachev's own view uh, about how a society ought to be governed. Uh, okay, let's turn to uh, the domestic political struggle a little bit more and get down to personalities. And here I've got a question uh, again for Ambassador Matlock. Uh, we already know you, uh, you had a lot to deal with Gorbachev, but you were also dealing with Yeltsin at the same time. I think one of the big questions that uh, we have historians have is how much of the struggle between uh, Yeltsin and Gorbachev towards the end of the Soviet period was a struggle for personalities, a struggle over power, and how much of it was a struggle over competing visions uh, of the future of both Russia and, and the Soviet Union? Well, there's an element of both. But, you know, I think the most decisive element there was a struggle over power. And to greatly oversimplify, but I think 
at, at the same time be accurate uh, in the final analysis. Yeltsin, uh, having been uh, maneuvered himself and uh, uh, to win the election as president of the Russian Republic, the Russian Socialist Federated Soviet Republic, uh, was uh, uh, willing to bring the Soviet uh, Union down uh, uh, in order to get rid of Gorbachev. Uh, the chemistry between the two had, had uh, developed so poisonously from the, I would say, from the point that uh, Gorbachev tried to expel uh, Yeltsin from the leadership uh, back in 87. Uh, 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 but at the same time, left him in Moscow in a, a position that later, as, as Gorbachev opened things up, Yeltsin was able to challenge him. I think that became, you know, almost a personal uh, struggle that uh, it's going to take some future Shakespeare to really incorporate it, I, I think, uh, uh, fully in its drama. And it's, uh, it's a drama that uh, not everybody pays attention to. Uh, but uh, the remarkable thing, and I must say that Ray was one of the first to call it to our attention, was how from uh, about uh, 1990 and 91, more and more Russians were speaking about breaking up the Soviet Union as the liberation of Russia. Uh, the idea that the other republics were somehow feeding off us and so on, uh, and uh, uh, and I think that Yeltsin was able to, uh, uh, to to capture some of that spirit. But I think what made it particularly uh, emotional uh, for the two of them uh, were was the per personal hostility uh, that developed. So we had a, a struggle between Gorbachev and Yeltsin that plays a central role uh, in the demise of the country. I think another event that uh, was surprising to many people in the West that also uh, played a role in transfiguring uh, the Soviet Union is the revolutions in, in Eastern Europe in 1989, the Velvet Revolutions, the breaching of the Berlin Wall. Uh, Paula, uh, you were sitting in Washington at that point. I think you had left the NSC staff by then. Uh, but nevertheless, as you looked at what was happening in uh, Eastern Europe in that, uh, during that year, and the Soviet reaction. What did you find surprising about Gorbachev's reaction, the way he handled it, uh, something that you hadn't anticipated or wouldn't have anticipated, say, in 1987 or even 1988? Well, I think one of the most significant things here was, in fact, what you just said, the way in which he handled it. And when one, when one looks at his legacy, although he's uh, uh, condemned for certain use of force, uh, like in the case of Latvia, Lithuania. I picked that out because uh, that's one that came in the later stage of 1991. But during this period of, you know, 88, 89, 90, you know, going forward, no, it was very significant the way in which he handled the, 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 these kinds of movements and re revolutions taking place throughout Central and Eastern Europe. And the way he did handle it was in letting it go forward where there wasn't, you know, uh, you didn't have troops lined up at the doorstep or like looking at Charter 77, remember Ambassador Matlock in the Czech Republic, you know, those revolutionaries and they moved forward. And this wasn't like the Czech Republic of 68 or Hungary of 56, that basically this was part of Glasnost that actually, you know, if, if you will, uh, was taking hold and furthering and nurturing these kinds of, of uh, 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 liberalization going forward in Central Europe. I found something that I admittedly didn't remember, but the three of you, I bet, would remember this. I saw in, in at the time, in looking back and going over my own thoughts about Gorbachev's legacy, that it was in, if I may, in October of 89, that Gennady Gerasimov, you know, uh, he was uh, the, the, the ministry, foreign ministry spokesman. He made a joke about your, the very question you just asked. You know what his joke was? He said, quote, we now have the Frank Sinatra doctrine. He has a song, My Way. So every country decides on its own which road to take. 
And of course, that's what followed. But actually, I think Gerasimov's statement <laughs> answers your question. Uh, that was the policy. Uh, not using troops force, let them go their own way. Yeah, uh, yeah I do remember the Sinatra doctrine. Uh, and it was a much better doctrine than the Brezhnev doctrine. I think we'd all agree. Uh, Ray, I want to come back um, to an issue that's already raised now, sort of get your analytical assessment. You know, it seems to me that one of the uh, forces that Gorbachev unleashed was really nationalism uh, in Eastern Europe, certainly uh, in, in the Soviet Union itself. Uh, but despite the fact that he had grown up um, uh, in the south of Russia, close to the Caucasus, uh, nationality questions always seem to be a blind spot in his politics. Um, could you give me a sense, your analytical assessment of what is it that Gorbachev didn't understand about the power of uh, nationalism in the Soviet Union uh, and how that led to the, uh, the eventual breakup? I think um, Gorbachev might have had a blind spot about how deeply um, nationality sentiments go. And, and I think we as Americans often have that as well. Uh, we can, countries look back a thousand years and more and can still find uh, age old grievances uh, to quarrel about and, uh, and age old reasons why uh, they should no longer be part of the political entity that they're then part of, why they should be independent. And I think um, Gorbachev growing up in the Soviet system believed that, uh, the, that the Soviet Union had sufficiently, or at least initially believed, had sufficiently integrated uh, these republics into one country that they would continue to be that way. Now, uh, I think he gradually to, came to realize that this was an untenable position and he tried desperately hard to find a juridical mechanism to keep the Soviet Union together. If you remember the coup in August of 1991 occurred while he was out of Moscow, but also occurred just as the new um, national, the new constitution creating a new set of relations between the center and the, um, and the republics was supposed to come into effect. And in that new, um, political schema, the, um, that the, the republics were, vert, were quasi independent already. They were pretty much autonomous in their um, domestic affairs. And uh, the uh, Soviet Union as a whole had some, still some control over foreign policy issues, but much less about what was going on domestically in the countries. And that was a primary reason, I think, for the timing of the coup. Um, so um, I think Gorbachev gradually became, came to realize it, but he just could not master it. Okay, we, uh, I think we've covered a lot uh, of ground so far and what was happening back in the late 1980s, um, early 1990s. Uh, you know, I'd like to end with a series of questions sort of about the legacy. And I start with you, uh, Ambassador Matlock, uh, and uh, ask the question about what is the Gorbachev legacy uh, today as seen from, uh, say, Putin's Kremlin? Uh, how did he look at the, this period of the 1980s Gorbachev's reform? And how is, might that have impacted on the way he's dealt with the, uh, the very difficult problems that Russia faces domestically uh, today and will in, into the next, uh, in, during the next several, several years at a minimum? Well, um, first of all, I think that one of his great achievements was uh, that acting with the power of the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, he took the party uh, out of complete control of the country. It was a totalitarian regime, uh, highly centralized and one which could not really be effectively, given those powers, changed bottom up. And now, and I think that his great achievement was 
that he used the power of the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union to take that party out of control of the country, without which there would never be a possibility of a democratic evolution. Now, he thought that there could be a democratic evolution. At first he thought, I'm sure when he took power, that he could make the changes using the party. But when he started the changes, he began to get opposition precisely from the apparatchiks in the Communist Party. And so he gradually, though he could not admit this openly, obviously, understood that he had to destroy the party's control. Then the second decision was not to use force to try to keep that system in power. When force was used, it was used without his knowledge, as in Georgia at one point, when there were demonstrations over Abkhazia, and then later in January in the attack on the Vilnius television tower, he did not order that. In fact, the people who organized that were the people who later organized the coup against him. So the, the fact that he steadfastly refused to use force to keep himself in power. And by the way, subsequent uh, people, uh, one of the people who tried to persuade him uh, and, uh, to use force to prevent a breakup of the Soviet Union uh, in August uh, uh, 1991 was Anatoly Subchak. Uh, you might say the, uh, the, the person who uh, uh, trained Vladimir Putin, uh, Subchak, and Subchak later told me this personally, tried to persuade him to use the military to stop the, uh, uh, the meeting uh, between Yeltsin and the Belarusian and Ukrainian leaders, uh, which took place in Belarus via Pushcha. Gorbachev turned him down uh, and said he would not use force. And I think he was the first Russian reader in history who has refused to use force to keep himself in power. And I think that's something to remember today that people don't have. So uh, I think that his two great achievements were one, policies that negotiated an end to the Cold War. It was not a victory, except in the sense that, you know, our system survived and his eventually didn't. And yet the Soviet Union broke up despite the end of the Cold War and not because of Western pressure. Another, so one of the mistakes we've made later was to look at that as if it was a victory and as if Russia were the defeated uh, country. So uh, now uh, I have said, and, and I, I use this analogy uh, 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 that, you know, after all Moses, never reached the promised land, uh, uh, people don't hold that against him. Uh, and Gorbachev, I believe, delivered his people from tyranny if they have not found a promised land since, it's their responsibility, not his. Very good, uh, Ambassador Matlock. Kapal, I turn to you and look at this from the, the Washington perspective. You know, are there any lessons that we should learn from how we dealt with Gorbachev in the late 1980s, late Soviet era that might help us see our way through uh, this very difficult period in relations with Russia today? Or are we simply in different, uh, radically different circumstances, radically different leadership in Russia? Uh, that means that there really is not much uh, that we can apply from the late 1980s to the current situation. Well, I, I do think the personalities are different, that I, I would say, because you, you ended with that note. There are real, to say the least, fundamental differences um, in the way they decided to execute uh, their leadership tenure and also uh, the, the goals and the objectives which they set for themselves. Um, and I, I think uh, fundamentally uh, we have seen where Gorbachev uh, opted uh, to not use force. Although I know Jack had mentioned uh, about uh, 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 Lithuania, Latvia in 1991, 
uh, admittedly, they do not, those countries do not see it the same way because it was his tenure. But the fact is, we see that force is used quite extensively during Putin's time. So one, you asked, is it fundamentally different? Yes. But let me, from the US side, what are some lessons learned? I think there are some, some lessons. First, I do think that we have to remind ourselves that, bluntly speaking, relationships are never stagnant and that one has to always be looking for those windows of opportunity to advance an agenda. We haven't in our session talked about yet, but the rather groundbreaking uh, INF, uh, signing of the INF Treaty, which uh, during a Reagan-Gorbachev period was rather significant in terms of taking a whole class of nuclear weapons you know, off, off the table, if you, if you will. So I think that's one lesson. Secondly, I think it underscores also, again, maybe this is so commonsensical, but the need for agility, uh, agility of purpose. I mean, here we were witnessing, and your question to me earlier, we were witnessing an evolution. So first from great skepticism in Washington to one where we were looking at what was happening on the ground and also what was happening throughout Central and Eastern Europe and the need to be more adaptive and looking at how can we, uh, uh, from our own perspective, advance an agenda given the kind of course of events. Thirdly, I think also what's important here, you know, Gorbachev put forth perestroika and glasnost. No, the glasnost. There was skepticism about whether that would actually translate into action. But I'd simply say here a parallel, but it's of a different nature, words matter. Uh, Putin gave that famous Munich uh, security conference speech back in 2007, in which he, in essence, really laid out uh, his own vision um, uh, relative to not only the, the Soviet Union, but in particular, if, if saying it in the sense of the sphere of, of, of what was the Soviet Union, but also in terms of how he saw uh, Russian citizens. And he literally has certainly, uh, uh, I think, acted upon his words. He's been, there's a consistency. And I'd say finally, um, uh, you know, Reagan had the slogan, peace through strength. And this just comes back to US policy. I think that when we are engaged internationally, and when we also are have strong alliances and relationships as we, we have forged in dealing with the current uh, situation, crisis situation and uh, aggression into Ukraine, but when we also have a strong uh, economy, politically and militarily, a strong base and foundation, we can also have some impact and bring about kinds of change. So I think those elements we need to be reminded of. Um, uh, I say that because just as one example, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, my own view on that one is, I think that sent a signal to Putin. And I think Putin felt that after that, that he felt he could actually take the action in Ukraine, that there wouldn't be consequences for it. And it was a good time to do it. So there are lessons learned here, I think, and we see from that period to the present time. Thank you, Paula. And Ray, a final question to you. Uh, you spent much of your career sort of analyzing uh, the Soviet Union, uh, analyzing Russia. Um, you know, uh, as you think back to this, uh, the Gorbachev period, the situation in today, uh, are there any guidelines that you would offer to uh, young analysts in particular, what they need to think about, uh, how they need to approach this problem, if they're going to be, be able to understand uh, where, where Russia is tending at this point, uh, both in its domestic politi politics and its foreign policy. Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, if you're an analyst, I think you'd first of all need to remember that analysis is not prediction. Uh, that's for soothsayers. Analysis has to do with looking at probabilities and evaluating uh, one set of probabilities against another. And particularly, I think Americans pay too little attention to low probability, high consequence events. For example, when I drafted that cable 
which Ambassador Matlock refined it and approved to send into Washington about the possible collapse of the Soviet Union. I wasn't predicting the collapse of the Soviet Union. I was looking at a, that as a possibility that was would be sufficiently important in its consequences that we ought to be paying attention to those possible consequences. Um, another thing that I think we need to look at is um, the issue of political culture and how political cultures differ. And this is something that embassies can be particularly helpful in. Uh, I think we, uh, as Americans, I think we talk too much and we don't listen enough. Uh, we should be listening more to what countries are trying to tell us. We should be listening to what they are telling us about what their national interests are, not telling them what they should be doing or what our national interests are. Um, political culture is something that changes very slowly. Um, it doesn't mean it doesn't change at all, but it's a slow process. And we have a tendency not to have a very good historical sense. Uh, we think that, uh, we tend to think that democracy is inevitable. Um, it isn't inevitable. Russia may eventually get there, but uh, it's a difficult process for a country with the Russian political culture to go through. We should remember that uh, as late as well into the 20th century, uh, several Western European countries were still dictatorships. Uh, the process of producing a democracy does not always go flow simply in one direction. So I think those are the, some of the things that we can learn by looking more closely at political culture and by paying more attention to history. Okay, we've had, I think, a very rich discussion. It's time to turn uh, uh, to all the other participants for their questions. If you put them in the chat, uh, we'll answer as many we can, as we can in the time remaining. Uh, I see we have two that are actually related in some way. Uh, the question of Gorbachev's role in German reunification, um, and that I think also ties in with the uh, the question that we've uh, seen debated uh, since uh, uh, since 1990 uh, is uh, what assurances were given to Gorbachev during the discussion of German reunification on NATO expansion eastward. Uh, and perhaps we could turn to you, uh, Ambassador Matlock, for a first stab at that. Um, I believe you participated in some of those discussions and have uh, some inside knowledge of what was actually conveyed to the Russians at that time. Yes, uh, during the negotiations over German unification, uh, in effect, the uh, Bush administration uh, did uh, take the expansion of NATO you know, off the table unofficially. Now, this goes back to the meeting that Bush had with Gorbachev in Malta in December uh, 80, uh, 89, uh, when um, they agreed, number one, that we were no longer enemies. Number two, Gorbachev agreed he would not use force in Eastern Europe if there was political change. And number three, uh, uh, President Bush guaranteed the United States would not take advantage of changes in Eastern Europe. Well, at that time, the issue on German unification was what would happen to the territory of the German Democratic Republic, East Germany. And uh, at one point in February, uh, when uh, it was uh, the idea of the German foreign minister, uh, Genscher, uh, that we should guarantee uh, that East Germany uh, would not actually become under NATO jurisdiction as part of the deal. Uh, and uh, 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 the Baker brought this to Moscow and used the famous phrase. He was asking a question in a sense because he said, you don't have to ask this now, but think about this. Uh, provided uh, there is no expansion of NATO jurisdiction to the East, not one inch, wouldn't it be preferable to have a united Germany ensconced in NATO with all the limitations that has, you know, on the future? In other words, what he was saying, you would, you need to keep Germany 
uh, integrated in NATO or else, and he didn't actually use the words, but the implication is what's to keep them from going nuclear or, or other things in the future. And now, and Gorbachev answered, uh, any expansion of NATO to the east, of course, is unacceptable, but I understand what you're saying otherwise. And uh, I want you to know that we no longer oppose an American presence in Europe. This had been our policy, it is no longer. We want you to stay in Europe. And he said, you don't really need 300,000 troops, but we want an American stabilizing presence. That is our current policy. Now, this was not pursued and it never got directly into any uh, 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 agreements. They were talking about East Germany, but the word was very broad when you say not one inch. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, and later when Baker got back to Washington, he was told by the lawyers, you can't have a united Germany in NATO and exclude the territory of the GDR. I mean, that's just legally possible. So it just wasn't talked about anymore. And it was not, of course, uh, in the, the treaty, though the treaty did treat the territory of the GDR differently and that the uh, the, 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 the Treaty on German Unification uh, prohibited the stationing of any foreign troops, that is non-German troops, in the territory of East Germany or stationing any nuclear weapons there, and that is in the treaty. Now, all of this was in the context of the agreement uh, which Bush uh, confirmed in writing in a letter to Gorbachev uh, that he sent in December uh, 89, that we would not take advantage of, uh, in effect, a retreat from Eastern Europe. So I think that uh, uh, it was simply not negotiated further. I would say also that the German foreign minister, the British prime minister, uh, at least those, repeated even more specifically uh, Genscher, the German foreign minister, told Gorbachev at one point explicitly this applies not only to East Germany, but to East Europe in general. So the general message of Western diplomacy was to take that off the table. Uh, it did not result in a legally binding promise, but we definitely diplomatically took it off the table. And by the way, I would say that this was a time when we were negotiating uh, dozens of very important agreements in many areas when you isolate these and look at them, and you think of how many of the, these balls that Gorbachev and our leaders had in the air at the same time, it's incredible how uh, so many of them turned out well that they did. But I think that at that time, if I had been asked any time in, in uh, 89, uh, if uh, Germany is unified, uh, is there an agreement that there won't be an expansion of NATO? I would have had to say, yes, that's our policy. Why should we expand NATO? If Eastern Europe is democratic, and uh, 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 why would we expand NATO? At that point, it didn't make any sense. Uh, Paula, Ray, um, uh, would you like to add anything to what Ambassador Matlock has said? I, I will just jump in, um, uh, not, on just the, not on the piece about German reunification, but more the issue of NATO. Um, I'll say this, you know, there is clearly a difference of opinion about that whole evolution of the expansion of NATO and what that meant for, the, uh, uh, for Moscow. Um, I say this because, I mean, Baker himself has been asked that question. Do you feel that you, uh, uh, to use the word, I think that was in the chat, deceived, you know, Moscow, um, uh, my answer to it, when I look at what he said, I think was no. I think there was a genuine intent here, but this goes to maybe what Ray said earlier, political cultures, and maybe it's about words and how words were perceived and intent. But I look at a second, I caught, I was very struck by the fact that the current Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, did a very, very extensive press conference, and you can see it in writing, where he actually went through blow by blow by blow uh, 
of that period and what was said and what was promised and the perspective from the US side of what was said and what was the Russian uh, reaction. So I'll say this, the one thing that I would add in the mix, I do think that over the issue of NATO, I think there was an attempt at NATO expansion to have an openness. There is the Russia NATO Council. And when you hear the NATO Secretary General speak to this issue, they talk often about how uh, there is a intent of bringing Russians in to look at an, uh, uh, military exercises, what the intent is. It's a collective defensive um, 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 uh, alliance, not an offensive one. So I, I don't think that people will change their positions on that, but I felt it was worth injecting those few comments in here, and especially the fact that there is a Russia-NATO Council, which the purpose was to bring Russia into the fold, not to exclude them, and to at least to provide some kind of confidence building measure. Yeah, this is going to be a great um, uh, topic for dissertations by numerous graduate students, historians over the year. I don't think we'll come to a resolution of it. Um, very complex and very many different perspectives. Um, we're running Can I just out of interject one quick uh, point. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I think the fundamental decision that was made in the 90s was whether you're going to have a, um, a European system that included Russia as a, as a full partner, a, a, a new security structure for Europe that included Russia, or whether you're going to have a security structure that excluded Russia. And the decision was made to have one that excluded Russia. Um, I have to kind of disagree with Paula here on the NATO Russian Council. Um, I mean, I think the Russians understood that that was, um, you know, that had no, um, no uh, real significant, real Russian participation that was in any decision-making capacity. They understood that. And, uh, you know, we should not have assumed that they were not smart enough to understand the difference between membership and, uh, and a talking forum. Well, right. like I said, we're not gonna resolve this issue here. I know it. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> a voice but not a veto is what we used to say. Uh, and, I, and we continue to say at this point, we are running out of time. Um, so I got one, I sort of two questions that I think are related um, and we could answer these or try to answer these uh, very briefly. And that is Gorbachev's legacy. Um, you know, what does Putin think Gorbachev's legacy is uh, and uh, how would he apply that to the current situation? Uh, and the second is more contemporary to the 1980s, and that is how did the Chinese look at what Gorbachev was doing and how did that impact uh, on the uh, the path that they took forward uh, from that period? So uh, let's start, we'll, we'll go in reverse order this time to Ray, Paula, and then end with you, Ambassador uh, Matlock, and then we, we'll wrap up the program. Go ahead, Ray. All right, I think both, uh, both Putin and Xi Jinping uh, have decided that uh, Gorbachev's what Gorbachev's uh, legacy is, is that uh, economic reform may be necessary, but it's also dangerous. And you cannot accompany economic reform with political reform. Uh, they may be wrong on that ultimately, but I think that's what their, uh, their conclusion is from the, uh, the Gorbachev era. I think, oh. that, I, I think that Putin um, <clears throat> clearly sees uh, Gorbachev's legacy as <clears throat> having uh, uh, contributed to a mismanagement uh, and inability to maintain control and maintain orthodoxy and in such a way that uh, uh, clearly, as he has said over and over and very directly, meaning Putin has said directly, just totally dismembered uh, the Soviet Union and uh, uh, the Soviet space. For Xi Jinping, I think Ray uh, put it well, um, uh, and I think it's uh, exemplified by the kinds of policies pursued in China. Right. So if uh, Gorbachev hadn't broken up the Soviet Union, I wouldn't have to invade Ukraine today, right? Um, okay. uh, Ambassador Matlock, uh, I'll leave the, the last word to you to wrap this up uh, and any thoughts that you have and how well, we should- The question is what uh, Putin thinks of Gorbachev. 
I think he agrees with his mentor, Zabchak, that Gorbachev made a mistake in not using force uh, to uh, keep the Soviet Union together. And uh, I think that uh, uh, he, uh, he has renounced communism as a system because uh, in effect it was anti-Russian, which of course it was uh, in the way it uh, uh, set up uh, the Soviet Union. And I think that uh, uh, he, uh, in that sense, uh, does want to uh, reestablish at least some elements of the Russian Empire. Uh, but obviously, that's impossible. And uh, we will see uh, how this all works out. Well, this has been, I think, a, a much rich discussion. Obviously, there's a lot more that we could, we could talk about. Uh, but unfortunately, our hour has run out. Uh, I want to thank the, the speakers uh, for their contributions. I want to thank the uh, NCAFP for, for hosting all of us. Uh, and thank you for all participating.